All right, so notice Deuteronomy 7, 25. It says, the graven images of their gods shall you burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor taken unto thee, lest thou be snared therein, for it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it. I guess that's about as strong a language as you're going to, as you're going to hear. Utterly detest it. And thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. So we're talking about when they go into the land and they'll overcome these, these different nations and they have these false gods. He says, don't, in fact, he says, don't even take the, the silver or the gold that's on them. In other words, everything about it, hate it, detest it, because God said it's an abomination to him. So you can understand that. And living in our day and age, though it may not be something you would sit up and, and pray to or look at or worship or whatever, still... God has God detests that, and that won't that won't be the first time we see that in the book of Deuteronomy. All right, so notice chapter 12, verse 31. 12, 31. Deuteronomy 12, 31. And in this case, we're going to go back to verse number uh, verse number 29. So it says in verse 29, When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, whither thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their land. So this was, this was God's plan. Go in, remove them, and God says, I'm going to do that for you. I'm going to use you to do it. Look at verse 30. Take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them, after that they be destroyed from before thee, and that, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. This is a point within the point here, but uh, one is, I don't think it's wise for people to study false religions, personally. Uh, I think you can pick up things that you don't need to be picking up. Uh, I know personally when I would meet people, especially in Chicago because I was there and maybe because it was a metropolitan area, you'd meet people that were, uh, well, had different backgrounds spiritually or non-spiritually, however you want to look at it. Anyway, when someone would come to me or I'd, I'd meet them, we'd go out soul winning, I'd meet somebody and I'd say, uh, so-and-so, you know, tell me a little bit, bit about yourself. Well, that's, uh, first of all, I've, I've studied all the religions. I think one guy told me he studied 70 different religions. And I knew then... And I know there's the power of the gospel, I get that. But I knew I was not going to get in some long conversation with a guy that's going to bring up this religion and that religion. I've got to take a verse. and I, I, It's just not wise. It really isn't. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, they had some preachers. And again, you may know them, and I'm not making it sound bad or wrong, but I'll tell you this. I, I think if you used to ask some of those people, they, they may would tell you they wouldn't have done, they'd have done it differently. But... I remember there was a particular preacher or preachers that went around and uh, they listened to rock and roll music, I mean, all that they could get, and then they would tell us what was wrong with it. I don't think it's wise to listen to all that garbage, get it in your mind, and then say, well, here's what's wrong with it. Uh, be honest with you, that's what God's saying right here. He said in verse 30, he says, how did these nations serve their gods? It'd be like us going into uh, some country and, and, and here's their false God. And we go, and you know what? I'd, I'd like to know how they did this. Well, God says, I don't want you to even do that. It's just not good for you to even have that in your mind. Look at verse 31. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God. For every abomination to the Lord which he hateth have they done unto their gods. Now notice that phrase there. Whatever the abomination is besides the very object itself, it says here, notice the language. Uh, for every abomination, uh, for every abomination to the Lord which he hateth, have they done unto their gods. So whatever this worship that they had with their gods, they've done these abominations. It says, and here's an example. Here's a very extreme one. For example, uh, for even their sons and their daughters, they have burnt in the fire to their gods. You know what that is? That's sacrificing their children. 
These are people so warped. Can you imagine? You, you, you so wrapped up in a false God that you say, I believe my God wants my child, and I'm going to take my child, and I'm going to burn it in the fire to, to this God I serve. And God says, that's what they did. And uh, you can imagine, and, and you may say, well, the children of Israel, it's a good thing they didn't do all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, they did. That's the problem. Because when God said, have nothing to do with them, and it takes a spiritual mind and a wise mind. I'm here to tell you, though, even when it comes to the New Testament church, there's things that we don't need to get involved in, and uh, they're, they're very, very dangerous to our spirituality. Verse 32, whatsoever, uh, what's, what things soever I command you, observe to do it, thou shalt not add thereto nor diminish from it. He says, it's, you, you say, well, that sounds like a very strict way of doing it. Well, it, it's just like when God said, don't turn to the left, don't turn to the right. Jesus said, uh, it's a narrow way. Doesn't mean it's hard, it means, but there's, there's, there's a narrow way amongst the broad way that people live, and the narrow way is Jesus Christ. Right is a, is a, is a thin line. Realize that error can be anything. Error has no boundaries whatsoever. Wrong has no boundaries but right does. Right has a boundary. There is a boundary to right and wrong. So anyway, there God said there's an abomination. Do not, do not participate in that. Or right, look at Deuteronomy 13, 14. We'll try to speed up here a little bit. Because some of these are going to be duplicated. You'll see this, uh, you'll see this uh, duplicated. Um, we'll go to verse 13 here. It says, certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, let us go and serve other gods which, have, which ye have not known. Then shalt thou inquire and make search and ask diligently, and behold, if it be truth and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought among you, thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword destroying it utterly and all that is therein and the cattle thereof with the edge of the sword. Uh, we'll stop there, but basically saying if you hear tell that these people are, are serving like these gods, this, in this case this, uh, the children of Belial, and he says you go ahead and, and find out if that's true what he's saying. It's almost like finding evidence. Go and make sure that what's being said about these people, if it's true then, then they are to be utterly destroyed. Uh, and, and that was God's way of dealing with that. Because a lot of people say, well, I don't believe God would do that. God did it. I think the picture here for us is, is that God has not given us a mandate to go out here and find people and destroy them and burn the cities down. But I think it's all, there's something being, the, what, do, what is taught in the Bible that, that matches this is separation. Come out from among them, saith the Lord. Be separate. And, uh, and I believe when it comes to sin in our life, that you need to get rid of it. It's, it's, it's a snare. It's something that we play around with. It's like a, uh, this little, you know, I, I can handle this. Hebrews talks about the besetting sin uh, that does so easily beset us. It might be different for every one of us, but something that we play, instead of saying, I'm going to destroy this, I'm going to say no, I'm going to put it behind me, I'm going to burn that bridge. And too many people do not do that. And they, and they have this repetition of, of uh, failures and lack of victory because they don't just get rid of it. Uh, if someone's messing around with things that, it'd be like if you're watching a television program you know is rotten and filthy, and you say, I'm not going to watch it, okay, for a day or two, and then you go back and you watch it. You know what, honestly, and this goes back to the days when I was a kid, and, and most people are probably not going to do this, but Jesus had a, had, a, had a plan like this. You know, there was a day when someone said, well, if you can't control that television, then take a sledgehammer to it. Now, we laugh at people like that now. But what did Jesus say? If your hand offends you, if your hand causes you to sin, what did Jesus say to do to it? Cut it off. Cut it off. If your eye, and this is where a lot of people have problems, somebody sit down and watching something. You know what Jesus said? Pluck it out. That's what Jesus said, not Moses. Now, I'm telling you, we, sometimes we're, we're so far off of what really the Bible says, maybe we, we wonder the positions that we're in, so I'm just saying the Lord's kind of speaking like that. All right, look at Deuteronomy 17, 1 and verse 4. Now, here's one that deals with sacrifice about how you would bring something to God. This is very interesting here. 
Thou shalt not sacrifice unto the Lord thy God any bullock or a bull or sheep, wherein is blemish or any evil favoredness, for that is an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Uh, skip down to verse 4. And it be told thee, and thou hast heard of it, and inquired diligently, and behold, it be true, and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought in Israel, then thou shalt bring forth that man or that woman which have committed that wicked thing unto thy gates, even that man or that woman, and shall stone them with stones till they die. Uh, now here's two different things here, but it's talking about worshiping gods. But here's the first one deals with, if you're going to bring something to God, what does God say? Don't bring the thing that's limping. And you go, well, I, I'm not going to miss that one anyway. Uh, I don't want to take, I don't want to give the, the, the one that looks very healthy to the Lord because I like that one. That one will reproduce other very strong species. God says if you bring, let's say you bring that sheep, and that sheep's got an eye missing. That sheep's limping. There's something wrong with it. It's sick even. Uh, you know what the Lord said that is? He called it an abomination. Now again, the attitude of people is, well, I'm going to give God whatever I can give him, but that's, 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 that's what I'm going to do. God says, I would rather you not give me anything, I believe, than to give me something like some poor representative, especially when you know you're going to keep the best for yourself and God gets seconds. I want to tell you something. A lot of people do that. Their energy, well, like some people try to make me feel good. Well, preacher, I didn't have anything else to do. I came to church today. Don't ever tell me that. Just, just do, either do or don't come, but don't say, preacher, you know what? I was going to go to a ball game, but they canceled it, and guess what? I'm at church tonight. I want to say, well, good for you, but, you know, so if the ball game was on, you was going to miss church and go do something else. But anyway, it's that same mentality, and we could plug in a hundred different illustrations, but I think God deserves our best. That's obvious. And God says it's not only something you ought to do, he says it's actually an abomination to God to, to treat God that way. Or right, look at Deuteronomy 18, 9 and 12. We've got to speed up here. You guys are asking too many questions and I've got to, I've got to move on. I'm sorry. So, all right. So you see the pattern here. I think some of these, you'll, you'll, it's easy to understand why God would not like something. Verse 9, when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the, the abominations of those nations. We've talked about that. Don't even learn what it is. Don't even sit down and discuss it. Verse 12, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Realize if God gives you victory in life and God would drive out certain things even in our own life, God's doing that because the people that did these things, God says, I judged them. And we don't want to be judged ourselves by doing the same things, all right? Look at Deuteronomy 20, 18. Deuteronomy 20, 18. Same thing here. Uh, go back to verse 16, just show you how extreme this is. It says, But of the cities of these people which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth. I know this is a hard thing to kind of understand, and we're talking about God Almighty. He's the only one that could have this kind of a judgment and be right when he does it. But when they went into some of those nations, they killed everything and everybody. Now think, why would a God do that? Because God is right. God has the right to do that. And I know we would look at this and say, I, I just don't, I don't think I could do that. And God says, but you know what? If God said do it, then that's what makes it right. God says, these will be a snare to you. Every la In fact, you say, why kill the animals? Why, why not leave, what, what, how's an animal going to affect me? God says, I tell you what, sometimes it just boils down to, if God says do it, let's just do it. Why, why have we always got to have the attitude, well, I, I don't get that. People say, I don't understand the Bible. So they go find some Bible that basically uh, is a comic book Bible. I say, well, there's a holy God that wrote it. I think if he wants you to understand it, he'll give you the understanding. Yeah. So anyway, I'm just, I'm, I know from, I guess, our perspective, you say, well, I don't know how anybody have a problem with that. I don't know either, I guess, but I guess that's just believing or not. So anyway, uh, don't, don't learn anything about them. Uh, all right, Deuteronomy 22.5. Deuteronomy 22.5. All right, it says here, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. 
for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Now, God's never changed his attitude toward that, and I know how uncomfortable this could be, but I'm here to tell you, we as a nation are suffering, suffering in many ways by something like this. You know, we all say, well, I say we do, maybe we don't anymore, but I'll say this, I'll not try to pull you into my thinking, but, you know, if a man walked through the door back there, well, let's just say uh, Mike Pomeroy walked through the door, and he's wearing a dress. <laughs> now, see, I don't have to do anything except say that. <coughs> okay? And you'd say, well, okay, that's, he's pro it's probably a skit, I guess. And yet we've got people today, men, that wear dresses. And yet men... You know, not supposed to wear a dress. But women are not supposed to wear that which pertains to a man. It's what the Bible says. And here's the thing. The abomination is to God. If we all thought, you know what, I don't want to disappoint God. You say, what, what, what do you think? Why would God care what I wear? Because he does. And here's where we're suffering. Ladies, in my opinion, are treated much worse these days. Because they're not looked at as feminine. They mock femininity now. They mock the lady. They mock this, uh, the damsel in distress mentality. Look, God didn't create you women uh, weak or in fear in the sense you're supposed to be kind of almost apologizing for being around. Uh, that's just not true. I've never preached that. But on the same token, God, has, God wanted the sexes to be divided and he wanted them to be distinct and there's nothing more distinct than a feminine woman who, who is proud that she's a lady or a man who's proud that he's a man. Now, we're not talking about caveman mentality, you know, bless God, you know, spit on the sidewalk and, you know, you, you, you got egg and uh, cheese hanging on your shirt going, I'm a man. No, you're an idiot is what you are. You're just a big old bumbling idiot is what you are. But I'm going to tell you something. Now we wonder why they talk about non-binary. Some of you are going, what's non-binary? Uh, you can't figure out what you are. Now, we didn't have that problem in, well, I say we didn't because I wasn't born, but you know, I, can just, I can just look at television, Hollywood. You can look at ball games. Women look like women, and they were treated with great respect. Women, you, you're the one that's paid the heaviest price. And the world bought into this, let the women start looking like the men wearing, wearing, hey, they still say today, I know who wears the pants in that family. Now, what's that supposed to mean? Well, you know what it means. Now, I'm not going to camp out on this thing, but I'm here to tell you, there was a day that you could go anywhere, even on Sunday, and they'd say, you've been to church, haven't you? You know why? Not because you're rich. Or you're looking down on people with your clothing. How sad people do that. They, they've taken something like that and almost twisted something to make it sound like, you know, I'll guarantee you, and I've said this before, if you, if you need a lawyer and you go to court, I'll promise you you want him to be dressed up. I'll guarantee if, if you're tried for something, they're going to dress you up because it means something. When I go to McDonald's, I don't know if they still do this anymore, <clears throat> they used to, you know, people used to wear uniforms. <coughs> Matter of fact, I, I, I liked it when the nurses looked like, looked like they, were, they had that certain nurse look. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now everybody wears the scrubs. I guess it's okay. Now, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're going to get way out here, and you're going to get so way out there that the, you're just going to get swept away with, uh, with your, uh, no, no. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. The problem is, there's some people's not had enough guts to stand up and do it, and they think, no, well, no one's going to do it anymore. How about you do it? I'm going to say this while I'm here, and my wife's not here. When I, before I ever met my wife, she's never wore a pair of pants that I know of. Well, she was when she was a little girl. Then her mom and dad started attending an independent Baptist church. And you can say, well, what did they do to her to make her? i tell you what, I've never asked her one time what to wear. That's her choice between her and her God. And I'm proud of her because I know some of the stuff she's taken for it too. 
I know people have said some very ugly things about it too. Look, if we all looked at that verse and just said, and here's the thing. If, if, if we would say, man, if, 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 if David walks in with a dress or Mike walks in with a dress on or, or he does, and I know Lee's not going to wear a dress. Lee will shoot himself if he wears a dress, I'm guessing. I think he's shaking his head. And I'm pretty sure Lloyd won't wear a dress. Well, he ain't even sticking his head out. He's afraid to even chicken. At least put your thumb out. Okay, he did it. Imagine me coming to the pulpit with a dress on. You say, well, other people are doing it. Yeah. Well, the thing is, let's all go back to who does it really matter? It matters to God. Here's the interesting thing. If you think this is some kind of a cultural thing since the 50s or 60s or 70s in America, let me tell you what the heathen were doing way back then. The women were wearing that which pertained to a man, or God wouldn't have put that in the Bible. I'll promise you that. And God says that is an abomination. Now, I'd hate to know this. I'd hate to know we couldn't have revival because we get stuck on something like that and we couldn't get victory over it. Now, how many times have you heard me say anything about it from the pulpit in almost two years? Very, very little. And I'm not afraid to. I, I, the verse is in the Bible. I'm trying to get people to understand what would you do for God? What would you do for God? What would you do exclusively for God? You know, this matter of dress is really not for this, this church or this denomination. It's for God. And uh, you say, well, you're a guy. It don't matter. To yeah, it does matter. I, there's been many a time I changed my dress because I thought somebody it might would bring, not necessarily reproach, but somebody might think as a preacher, you know what? Uh, so I, I think that way. I think we all should. All right, let's move on. Deuteronomy 23, 18. The rest of these will go pretty fast because most of these are going to be almost a repeat of what we've already said. But for some reason, it's a pretty big deal to God. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore, that's money, uh, that was involved in, a, in that process, or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any, for any vow, for even both these are abomination unto the Lord thy God. I guess the illustration that, bet, that best represents this that I could tell you is a guy came to my church one time when I lived in Iron Mountain. And this guy was always pushing the envelope with me. He was, he was something else, but I, <clears throat> most churches wouldn't have had him. In fact, that's probably why he, he bounced from church to church because people got mad at him. <clears throat> but he came up to me one day and he says, uh, I got this check for you. <clears throat> and I said, what's that for? He says, well, I won this in a card game. I don't know if I told him. I probably said, well, I'm going to cash that check. That check laid in my office for years. I don't know if he wrote it to me or if he wrote it to the church. I said, you know what? That money is not going to, I don't care how much, I don't care if it's a penny. And I think it was $50. And he was bragging about how the Lord must have blessed him playing gambling. I said, you know what? Wasn't funny to me. And this guy was out there, man. He, I could tell you some, some of the kookiest things he came up with. And that goes along with the territory, this idea of trying to, trying to make me feel like I got to take his money because he won in a card game. You know what? That's kind of what's being implied here. God don't need that kind of stuff. Uh, it should be, it should be, uh, every, look, when you put money in this offer plate, that, that's as, that is as holy an act as you'll ever perform. I remember Brother Hiles used to say because it was a large church and the auditorium said about 7,000 people. And sometimes during the offering, it'd take a while. And you see these people laughing. I watched Brother Hiles. He'd be sitting here. And he'd look up in the balcony. And it was amazing how a man of his age could look and he could see anybody in that auditorium. A big auditorium. You can imagine seat 7,000 people. He'd get up. He'd say, stop the, stop the music. He says, you up there. You up there cutting up. Yeah, you right there. You cutting up. This is the offering time. This is a holy time. And you're up there laughing and the carry on and the picking. He says, that's not right. Now you stop that right now. He'd sit down. Boy, it got quiet. You know why? Because giving to the Lord is a big deal. It's a real big deal. I wish we could kind of get back to that kind of that, that mindset. Now I'm not going to do that Sunday, so don't, don't be afraid if you're on your phone or something. But anyway, Mike. Let's move on. All right, hurry up here. Deuteronomy 24.4. Her for, now here, here's an interesting one. And again, I'm not going to camp on this one, but, but again, this is God's attitude. Uh, look at verse 3. And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and give it, and give it into, in her hand and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die which took her to be his wife, okay, her former husband which sent her away may not take her again, 
to be his wife, after that she is defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord. And thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Well, let me just say this. If that would cause the land to sin, God help us in America with the problems we have with marriage. Moving on. You, just, you can take that for what that says right there in the Word of God. If that's an abomination to God, wow, then how far could we be and be off base? All right, look at Deuteronomy 25, 16. For all, the, for all that do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination to the Lord thy God. We don't need to look at the content. There's, there's plenty there, but again, it's, it's to the Lord, and it's not to Moses or to the people. It's to, to the Lord. Deuteronomy 27, 15. Deuteronomy 27, 15. This one kind of echoes what we learned in Deuteronomy 7. Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image in abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsman, and putteth it in a secret place, and all the people shall answer and say, Amen. And it went on to talk about all the curses that would happen. So let's move on. Uh, that was 27, 15. Two more. Deuteronomy 29, 17. 29, 17. Again, this is about idols, and ye have seen their abominations and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were among them. It was talking about in Egypt how they saw those things and, and the different nations. Uh, all right, so there's that. Then look at Deuteronomy 32, 16. Deuteronomy 32, 16. 32, 16. It says, They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations, Provoke they him to anger. Uh, and that's an incredible chapter there, chapter 32. We won't get into all that. But here you see, so the point is this. You can go into the New Testament and you can see where God will echo some things about God. He, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God has not changed. Societies do change. So the problem is we either follow society or we, or we stay firm with God. 